get ideas about um, things you might speak about, and some of these might be helpful. But um, I would suggest that one of them is that when you have in Acts 16 and verse 10, the call uh, of Macedonia to Paul and his brethren when the gospel was first preached in Europe, that there's that call, you might say, still out there. And the church should never forget there are people who will hear the gospel and obey it. We may have to contact no telling how many before we can find them. But even if we can't get them to obey the gospel, we still have the obligation to do what we can to teach them. So it would be good to keep in mind uh, that the vision Paul saw was in the dream was the man from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. And of course, it's interesting to realize a great many people, if not a high majority of them, um, don't know they need help. So there's a problem we have in getting in our heads that uh, to go help people may mean that we've got to show that they need that help before we can help them. So that's something to keep in mind. Another thing that could be kept in mind is found in chapter 17, verse 6, and that is that um, the gospel will turn the world right side up, that it's already uh, wrong side up. And that's the way people who love this present world and are caught up in the blackness of sin see the gospel. And yet we need to do what we can, and this ties into um, the account of the Macedonians and the Macedonian call. We still need to be mindful that we have the truth. We are children of light, the light of the gospel. And we're interested in getting the world turned right side up because it's not now. And all you have to do is watch the news and get around people and you see how they used to say bottom side upwards it really is. Then too, like the Bereans, we need to prepare our minds to receive the word with all readiness of mind. Uh, that implies that there is a condition of the inward man or the heart or the mind that is such that it's ready to hear the truth. When you think of Luke 8 and verse 15, the honest in good heart, then you realize um, there are a lot of people that don't have an honest and good heart. Now, it might be that upon hearing the gospel that they do begin to be fair and objective in the application of truth to their thinking. But there's a lot to do with people in preparing them to receive the word where it will save their souls. And of course, we realize that we're taught to receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word which is able to save your soul. So a person who would not be of a disposition to follow proper constituted authority or be persuaded that God exists or Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, or the Bible's inspired Word of God. Uh, they could hear it all day long, but it may not, will not do them any good. So we need to make sure that we keep our minds uh, such a way as that we're ready to receive the truth. Uh, it's also true we might make application when, when Paul was in Athens, he encountered people who were religious and who were worshiping. In their case, they were idolaters. And um, Paul declared to them the true God. And we might make further application when it comes to the state of the religious world in Today, uh, denominationalism fits into this too, that they are worshiping, but they are not wor worshiping according to the truth. That reminds you of the Samaritan woman where Jesus told her that you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So there's an obligation on part of Christians who have been enlightened by the gospel to show people by the gospel the right way of living, the right way of worship, 
uh, the right attitude toward God, Christ, and the Bible, and the gospel. All of that fits in. Uh, I've said many times, and we all know it from experience, that you may uh, talk with someone one point, and they show no interest, but things happen in their lives that causes them to see things differently and to think differently. And later on, they're willing to, to follow the truth. And we never know, of course, when that might be. Uh, if you get to Acts 17, 29, in the same sermon Paul was uh, uh, preaching there at Athens at Mars Hill, he points out that those people are the offspring of God in the sense that all men are created by God. And uh, one of the things we need to be mindful of in view of the fact that we wear the name of Christ and we're members of his church is that if we are God's children, then we need to behave like it. Paul told Timothy, if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So, there is a proper way that we as members of the church are to behave ourselves. I imagine most of us, if not all, when we were growing up, were told by parents or grandparents or somebody, a teacher, to behave yourself. Well, we don't hear maybe a lot of that anymore, but nevertheless, if you are a child of God, there's a certain way that you behave yourself. And even though these uh, people were not yet believers in God and certainly not in Christ, there's a certain way that being then spiritual children of God, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, that we ought to live. Uh, we should also realize that God will judge the world. How is he going to judge the world? Paul declared that he's going to judge the world in righteousness, chapter 17, verse 31. Well, as I often do to define righteousness, I quote, the Psalm 172 or 119 verse 172, where David says, my tongue shall speak thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness. And certainly the righteousness that is spoken of by Paul is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the New Testament system. It's the perfect law of liberty, James 1 verse 25. And Jesus said, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So we need to be sober-minded. Uh, we don't need to be trivial when it comes to God, Christ, the Bible, our souls, what life's all about. Uh, Kevin, I see that you're here, and this another thought just came to mind about one thing your grandfather related to me many, many years ago. When he was growing up, he said he went to school and he was talking about secular school and that the teacher wouldn't let them sing, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream because it had in it, life is but a dream. And he would always, this teacher did, so your granddad said, but I always make a point, that that's the wrong way to view life. Life is facing reality and learning how to face reality and lead a successful life. Now, that man, according to your grandfather, was applying it to secular matters. But how much more so is that true regarding our living the righteous life of Christianity? Life is not a dream. It's not just uh, come see, come saw. It's not just la di da di da and going about your business. And yet I'm afraid some people have uh, developed a mindset that cannot face the realities of life in the flesh. You know, it doesn't make any difference if you're a billionaire and you've got the best education you could get, secularly speaking. You're still going to have the ups and downs of life, and you're going to die. Uh, I've got a quote in a bulletin board in my office, or as Jody calls it, my bear den. And uh, it, I took it out of a book by an old Texan of the 19th century, a rancher who was quite wealthy for his day. 
and he learned that he was dying. And I cannot make the quote. If I was close enough to go get it, I would. But uh, he said, uh, I have a million dollars and not one thin dime of it's going to stop me from dying. Well, uh, life is not a light matter. God says, that's your opportunity to find heaven, and that's what you ought to be doing with it. So that's how we ought to recognize the judgment that he will judge us by, as far as the Christian dispensation is concerned, by the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Uh, we also should recognize, and there are those who don't, they always have been. I haven't worked in a congregation or known anybody else in any congregation, no matter what their position was in that congregation. that didn't have people in it that took the assembling together of the saints in a very light manner. And yet at least every first day of the week, we are obligated to meet with our brethren for the purpose of worshiping God. And we know the five acts of worship, and I won't go into those right now. Uh, acts 20 and verse 7 makes it clear that Paul, who was in a very big hurry to get to Jerusalem before Pentecost, took several days to wait for the first day of the week because he knew that the brethren in Troas would all come together. And when they came together, it would be an opportunity to see all of them in one place. And they would be coming together to break bread. And of course, break bread, and I refer to this term in Sunday's sermon, and I use it often because there's so many of them in the uh, New Testament, and we use them all the time, we don't think anything about it. Uh, to break bread is a synecdoche, where a part stands for the whole, because we know the first day of the week worship in the Assembly of the Saints is more than breaking bread. You can't just take it literally, or you just have the brethren sitting around with bread, and they'd be breaking it into pieces. No, that stood for uh, the Lord's Supper, but it stood for all the items of worship, because there's more to the one singular acceptable worship in the assembly of the saints on the first day of the week than just the Lord's Supper. There have been those who have said, well, just do the part that's the most important. So we come partake of the Lord's Supper, and then they feel free to leave. Well, you can't find anything in the New Testament or in the way of a direct statement, example, or implication that indicates that that is the most important act of worship in the first day of the week assembly. But because of what it represents, it shows forth the Lord's death that he come and the bread the body he sacrificed and the fruit of the vine, the blood that he shed for the remission of sins, the blood of the New Testament, then that being so important to our salvation and to forming belief in Christ and everything else that pertains to godliness in Christ, that it stands for the whole of the worship. Um, so we should uh, thrill ourselves to come together to be with like-minded brethren, all of us collectively worshiping God in spirit and in truth. I think with all this COVID virus thing and us having to cut short uh, the amount of times every week that we assemble that I believe we actually miss one another and miss being together. And that's the way it ought to be. Maybe even then we don't miss one another like we really ought to. If we lived in a society like the first century Roman society, uh, we would be as Christians so far removed from everybody around us that we would crave the fellowship that existed with like-minded precious brethren. Well, the truth of the matter is it gets more that way every day here in America because people are removed further and further from any influence in spiritual things and moral matters when it comes to living godly lives. So we need to learn to cultivate being with one another and loving one another like we ought to. We need also to understand in Acts chapter 20, 17, is that 
members of the church because from them come preachers of the gospel. They don't just materialize from someplace outside the church. But preachers of the gospel um, are folks that their Christianity has grown into that in their lives. But, of course, in one way or the other, each member, according to our several abilities and opportunities, ought to be ready to teach somebody. Always there will be some teachers better than others. It's obvious that not just everybody should be a teacher, or you wouldn't have what James said, be not many teachers or masters, for we shall receive the greater condemnation. So it is an important thing that you prepare yourself to teach. As I've said many times, you can't teach what you don't know, and if you're going to know it, you have to go through the process of knowing it. And that's study and learning. And more than ever, it's the application personally of what you've studied and learned as you apply it to life's everyday activities. So we need preachers who will not shrink from declaring the whole counsel of God, Acts 20 and verse 17. I have known for a long, long time certain preachers who will preach the truth. I don't guess they've ever preached any error that I know anything about. But you can still be found lacking because you will not address certain topics. Um, if you don't address everything according to all or the whole counsel of God, then you have it done what Paul said that he had done in his work with the church at Ephesus. And he was reminding the elders that that's what he had done night and day with tears, teaching them, persuading men. So we need that kind of teacher. We don't need any Billy Grahams. And we don't need any people like that. Uh, if you really lived and preached anywhere nearly like Paul did, you wouldn't have a mass of people running over you to be your best buddy. And we might think, well, surely there's a way I can live that everybody will like me. Well, I don't know where you learned that from the Bible in general, and especially the New Testament, even more especially the life of faithful Paul and the proclamation and defense of the gospel. And he who was without sin was put to death by those who should have recognized him more than anybody else. So it is a challenge to be what you ought to be as a teacher of truth. And your pulpit may be your neighbor next door or some opportunity that you have, but there's a pulpit for everybody. Women don't think of themselves as gospel preachers, and they're not. It's not their role in the church to do that. But I couldn't tell you how many faithful, godly women in their sphere of activity in fulfilling the role that God gave them have taught so many people without exercising dominion over men the truth of God's word and led them to the gospel. So we need to understand that and do all we can with one another to try to show how that's done and that all of us should prepare ourselves to the best of our ability to try to teach other people and teach all the truth to people and not just some of it. Then I'll close with this thought, and I'm sure you can find a lot more lessons that you might want to cover from the book of Acts, but uh, we know Jesus said this not because you read of it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but because the inspired apostle Paul said it in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. Our Lord said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, he didn't say that there's not a blessing in receiving. He just said it's more blessed to uh, give than to receive. Let's talk about the receiving for a minute. If a person is to the point where he or she cannot help herself, is doing all she can or he can, then there's something wrong with that person when that person will not receive the necessary things they cannot provide for themselves. That's a far cry from people who don't want to do anything and expect everybody just to give them everything. At the same time, the brethren ought to be looking to see if there's anybody who has need as best they can tell. 
but we ought to be ready to help other people. And other people in need of help ought not be bashful about saying, I need it. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a reflection upon the honest person. Uh, we've all, in one way or another, at one time or another, in one form or another, needed some kind of help. So we usually think of charitable deeds as providing money for folks who don't have it, or food or clothing. Well, what's wrong with that? If you are starving, you ought to be able to accept food from somebody. Um, Peter was sinking beneath the waves when Jesus was walking on the water and he asked to come to him, he took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. And he asked Jesus, Lord, save me. Well, he needed it. He shouldn't have said, well, I asked to get out here and I got myself in this pickle, so I'm just going to drown rather than ask the one that can save me to save me. So there's, it is more blessed to give than to receive, but it's also a blessing to receive when you can't supply for yourself. There's an old story, and I may have told it sometime, and this happened 80, 90 years ago, back more than we may realize. But a woman who was an elderly widow didn't have any food to eat. She didn't know whether she was going to get it. And no screens on the windows in those days. And they didn't even have windows many times if you raised them to stay up without a window stick. I don't know where anybody knows what a window stick is anymore. But she had met, got to her wit's end and she was in the chair at the kitchen table by herself praying to God for food and for assistance, for what to do and how to do it. And there were a couple of old boys, teenagers, who happened to hear her out the windows they passed by. And being as a lot of boys are, they said, let's just go slip around and we'll go get some stuff and bring it to her. And uh, so they did. And she was still praying when they got back and they slipped in and set all the stuff on the table. And about the time they got it all on there, and we're about outside the house, she raised up and saw it all and began to thank God for the food. And that was their time to say, oh, God didn't give that to you. Said, we heard you praying. and We went out and got it, brought it in, and gave it to you. And she promptly replied to them and said, well, God gave it to me, even if he did use two devils to bring it. Well, God can do that, you know. He, he can uh, work things providentially to take care of his children. So it is more blessed to give than to receive. We ought to be prepared to do both and realize there is a proper attitude when it's time to receive, there's a proper disposition of heart when it's time to give to help other people. But Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 concerning the great collection that they were to grow in this grace also, meaning favor, which favor was the giving from themselves toward the poor saints down there in Judea and Jerusalem. So we need to learn to form in our minds um, what we are really doing, that people in trouble and bad situations provide an opportunity for faithful children of God to show forth their Christianity. And as we sing with the little ones, uh, this little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Sometimes we don't realize that we have a light to shine when it needs to shine. So we need to learn to look for those opportunities to let our light shine. Well, I'm going to let that be the last lesson that we might draw, although there are many others, from the book of Acts and terminate our discussion of that. But I'm going to start now in Romans, the first letter we're entering into the letters section of the New Testament. Remember, we had the biographical section, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, three of those, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are synoptic because they follow the same line from birth to the Lord's resurrection. Then we have John, it's more of a, a book 
of selected people, believers and non-believers, offering evidence that Jesus is the Son of God, and he begins before Christ's birth, back in eternity, the eternal word. But then we come to the historical section we just finished surveying, and that's the book of Acts. And now we come to Romans, the first epistle, in the epistolatory section of the New Testament, which is the longest section of the New Testament. And the first thing I want to do, and there are several verses that would, uh, um, well, you could find several that would correspond with these that I've chosen as key verses for the book of Romans. And you're very much aware of, of one of them. And that's Romans 1, 16, where I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Then in uh, verse 17, for therein, and therein means the gospel, for in the gospel, is the righteousness, we just talked about that from Acts 17, of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And he's talking about a faith system over and against a pure law system, which the law of Moses was. And we need to understand that point because when you get into chapters one and two, first he deals with the Gentiles' departure from God and where that led them. Then uh, he deals with the Jews and how they had the oracles of God delivered to them, but then they didn't live according to them. And then in chapter three, verse 23, he concludes all, both Jew and Gentile, under sin. So the gospel is the power of God to save, and it is a faith system. It is not a meritorious law system. But then that's one or two verses of Romans 1 that would be key verses in the book. Um, in chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is, if it's a pure law system, you sin, that's a transgression of the law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, you sin, you die. If you're going to try to approach God under a pure law system, just one sin, and you die. Now go back to Adam and Eve, and you'll see that. One sin. And they were separated from God, and through them, then came the opportunity for the devil to get into the world and um, cause all men to sin the way he gets anybody to through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. John talks about that in his first epistle. So the wonder of it, of it all, since the gospel is the power of God to save us from our sins, that that creates a situation to where we're not under condemnation. Uh, the law was to make man fully aware of the fact that you can't save yourself by law system. The law, and he says this in the book of Romans, was to make sin exceedingly sinful, make you fully aware of what it was like to sin. So all these particulars of the law of Moses was given. Peter said in Acts 15, if you go back and read that, that it was a yoke on them us and our fathers are upon us that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. No man could live the law perfectly. One man did, and that was Jesus Christ. Tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. That's why he could die on our behalf, and his blood can remit our sins. And belief in him, an obedient belief in him, then offer salvation to us and we're redeemed. So we're not condemned as faithful members of the Lord's church. That's been taken away. 
And 1 John 1, 7 makes it clear that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. That's the reason there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ. That's significant when teaching somebody who is a believer in Christ, who has repented of their sins, why that one ought to be baptized into the death of Christ. Romans 6, 3, 4, Romans 6, 17, and 18, is because Christ shed his blood in his death, and his blood must be contacted. And so the blood's applied when one completes his obedience to the gospel, God's power to save, when he's immersed in water by the authority of Christ, into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for or unto the remission of sins. And that blood contacted him being baptized into his death then keeps washing us of our sins as we continue to live according to the truth. Um, how do you do that? Well, again, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain, pointless, useless, worthless, in the Lord. Well, Paul said in the Ephesian letter, Ephesians 1, 3, as he begins that letter, that uh, God's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places somewhere. And where is it? It's in Christ Jesus. Paul also said in the Galatian letter that we're baptized I-N-T-O into Christ based upon our faith in him, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. So it's important to understand then that we do not stand condemned before God as we're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because the blood continues to flow to cleanse us from our sins in this system of faith. That's what it means to continue in the perfect law of liberty. In chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, I would say this would be the one I would choose at this point. Um, to show the uh, other verse, that are verses that I want to use. The first three verses of Romans 10, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record, Paul writes, that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Well, I think that's uh, just an echo of what we've been saying. Remember what we said about righteousness that we are righteous before God as we faithfully follow the teachings of Christ. And um, we are servants of righteousness, Paul said, to those who have been baptized in the death of Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. Verses 17 and 18, that God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, being then made free from sin, watch it, you became the servants of righteousness. And servants, there's the Greek word for slave. You chose to become a slave to Christ. Why? Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. John 14, 6. So I choose Romans 1, 16 through 17, and Romans 8, 1 and 2 and Romans 10, 1 through 3 as key verses. Now, you'll find a number of verses throughout Romans that would parallel right with those three. In other words, they're saying the same thing. But especially do I know Romans 1, 16, and 17, because he's beginning this rather lengthy letter, and that becomes his purpose statement, to declare it is the gospel that whereby God locates his power to save us from sin and not the law of Moses, and it's the gospel believed and obeyed that gives us the position of not standing condemned any longer and frees us from the law of sin 
and death because we're under the blood of Christ as we're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. There are uh, some key words. I would say the word all. How would the little three-letter word A-L-L be a key word? Because he's showing that everyone that is accountable to God can be saved from their sins. But before that, they all got themselves into position of needing to be saved because he says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all is a very important thing. You know, when you're dealing with logic, you don't usually want to use an all-inclusive term that has everybody in a certain class. All Americans are nice people. All Germans are nice people. No, you're taught to say some Americans are nice people. Some Germans are, some Japanese, some Brazilians or whatever. Usually you speak in area of some. You rarely uh, do anything in reasoning by saying all. I, there's very little you can affirm that whereby you would say all. But in the case of those in the church who are faithful, all of them are saved. And those outside of Christ who are accountable to God for their actions, all of them have sinned. So all are in need of the gospel of Christ. So you find a great commission saying, Christ saying, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Or you could say all creatures and say the same thing. Then I've already mentioned a, a key word, and this word is righteousness. Um, this brings about a right relationship with God. That's what the whole gospel system's about, is to set things in order. Well, things aren't set in order as far as mankind's concerned with God until we're in a right relationship with God. Thus, we're reconciled to God because we've been justified and we were purchased by the blood of Christ. We're redeemed. Those are very important terms in setting out the whole gospel system. So if we would be righteous, it's because we are submissive to the gospel of Christ. Uh, there is the, and probably need to quit here by the time I finish this, there is the false doctrine of um, righteousness the doctrine of righteousness that comes from Calvinism that says the very life of Christ that was sinless when you believe in him is applied to you. That's just not the case. We're made righteous because of our belief and obedience to the gospel of Christ and the blood cleansing us from sin. God sees us because of our faith in Christ as if we had never sinned. So, that's the truth about how a person is made righteous in the gospel system. So that's how one is um, brought into a right relationship with God. You become God's child. You're a member of his family. The Lord adds you to his church. You're a member of the body of Christ. You're a citizen of the kingdom of, of heaven and so on. You're a priest in that you're a part of his temple. The church is a place of worship. So all of those uh, relationships describe what we are when we wear the name Christian properly, which it means you're of Christ. This gets us back to what we said earlier, that if we really are Christians, then we need to behave like Christians. Well, I don't know how to do that. I don't know the teaching of the New Testament concerning what it is to behave like Christians. The Bible starts out, in fact, he does it in Romans. If you turn over to Romans 12, uh, you'll see that he makes it clear to these brethren later on, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. 
which he says is acceptable unto God. And he says it's your reasonable service. Then he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that uh, good and perfect will of God. So that's saying behave like Christians. So it all starts in the mind, doesn't it? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So that's where it all begins. And then we're taught to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. And that means set our affections on the teaching of the Bible and I live. That's what's from above. Uh, the earth is centered in on sensual things, on the matters of the flesh. So we need to understand that part and that. And then one last thing on key words is um, God forbid. You'll find that used several times. Uh, I think it's used about 10 times. In the Greek, literally, it reads, if you read the Greek, may it never be so. When he says in chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. Uh, no, sir, that's not the point of salvation by grace. We're to be doing all we can to live like the New Testament says we ought to live. And then the grace of God, the favor of God, through the blood of Christ will continue to cleanse as we from time to time uh, sin or have a wrong thought or whatever. Uh, that's not your purposed way of living. That's not what you enjoy. You abhor that kind of thing. And you work toward not thinking such thoughts. And you repent of them when you see that you've had those thoughts or when you do something that you shouldn't measured by the word of God, or you leave undone what you ought to do. The Christian will do those things from time to time, but that's not the settled way of life. First Corinthians 15, 58 tells us about that. We're steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Well, Paul even said as great a servant of God as, as he was, that he had not yet attained, he said to the Philippians. If there's one thing he did, he sought with singleness of mind to serve God. And thus, he would say, forgetting those things which are behind the mistakes you made this morning, repent of them and pick up and go on. But it also means any good things you did this morning or yesterday or a year ago or whatever, don't rest on your laurels, as we might say. Pick up and be ready to go on to greater knowledge and practice of the truth with a penitent mind. And then I'm going to close with the key thought of the whole book, which, remember, was trying to get over to the Jews who are Christians that the law has fulfilled its purpose, its law system. And the uh, gospel is the way God saves people today. That's where he's located his power. Romans 1, 16, or 17, uh, the just shall live by faith. Now that can be one's individual faith in God, Christ, and the gospel, which is formed by the word of God, which he says, so then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. But it also can be read in this way. We're justified by the system of faith that is the gospel system. Um, I tend to think it's a second one. It's like contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. He's saying they're contend for the whole New Testament and every component part of the New Testament. Well, the whole uh, of our faith, our personal belief in God is formed by a proper understanding of the New Testament. But itself is a system of faith. And that's the point that Paul's making. It's not a law system which would still mean that the law of sin and death is reigning, but it's a faith system. And the grace of God is extended to people who are obedient to the gospel. And as they labor in Christ, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse them. And thus, there it, it's a place of growing and developing. And that's a marvelous thing. So I think uh, we'll stop there and we'll get more of the Lord willing next week in this background introduction. We've looked at key verses, key words, and a key thought. You might add to those.
but we'll stop here tonight. And then do you have any questions about anything we said?